Boom, we ready? My name is Menasha Wolf. I grew up in Australia and live now in Brooklyn. Does God overreact sometimes? It was just weeks after the revelation at Sinai and the Jews went and served the golden calf. Of course, God's reaction was one of anger, upsetness to the Jewish people, and those that were responsible were put to death. This seems like a harsh punishment. And if you just nitpick this story, you can look at God as this jealous, uh, angry ruler. But I think it's important to take it in a larger context. Think of it as a paradigm of a parent to a child. When the parent punishes their child, it's not to hurt them, it's to discipline them, to educate them. And when God was showing a harsh response, he was telling the Jewish people, your actions, your behavior carries weight. From this story, when the Jewish people turned around, recognized their mistake, we learn forgiveness. And so God's response here was not one of trying to hurt the Jews, wasn't unmeasured. God's response was trying to steer them in the right direction for their own growth. Hi, my name is Naftali Silberberg. I am the co-director of curriculum for the Royal Jewish Learning Institute. So the question is, does God think before he acts? Yes, of course, God thinks before he acts. Take a look at the world around you. How much thought must have gone into making a world as beautiful and as intricate as the world that we inhabit? But why did God create a world in the first place? Did he think about that? Yeah, he thought about that, but after he had the desire. We don't know why, but God had a desire. He didn't want to be alone. He wanted to be in a relationship. And he wanted people to be in a relationship with them. And that's not a product of thought. That's a product of God's essential desire. My name is Arlo Loshak, and some people tell me that I may be a scholar of some sorts. Does God give up on people? If a person has a really tough life and they feel like God has never just been there for them, things have gone right, they've lost loved ones, they're not doing well financially, whatever it could be. So I can understand that at some point, such a person would say, to, hey, hello, did God give up on me? I, I, I can certainly understand why a person would feel that way, and I would be heartbroken with them, and I would tell them that the answer is no, absolutely not. Do you not see it? Yes, you don't. Uh, is it difficult for you to understand how it could be that God has not forsaken you when you feel that he has? It, it, yeah, it's difficult to see that. But the belief alone that it's still true, that itself could generate hope belief that God does not give up on you. And so somewhere along the way, somewhere down the line, he'll pick up the thread or you'll pick up the thread. That alone could keep a person hopeful and, uh, by, and then by extension, keep them, keep them going. Hi, my name is Barrow Politico. I'm from Los Angeles, California. Does God make mistakes? That's a question that a lot of people have cause to ask. Even Moses, when he saw how brutally the Jews were enslaved in Egypt, uh, confronted God and said, why have you done harm to this people? They, they don't deserve it. But of course, the Torah tells us that God is perfect, knows the future, and doesn't make any mistakes. So how are we to, to make sense of this? Number one, everything that God does is for the best, and that God has a plan, and that God knows what he's doing. It doesn't mean that God has some kind of complex plan, which we just don't know. And if we only knew, then we would understand. What it really means is like the verse says, and Isaiah, my thoughts are not your thoughts. God's thoughts, God's intellect is of a, such a superior quality to ours that we simply don't have the capacity to process it, to understand it. Like a baby. It's not that the baby just doesn't know things that adults know. The baby just isn't developed enough. The baby doesn't have the capacity to understand even a simple thing that even an older child or an adult can understand. How much more so is the, the gap between our brains our intellect to God's infinite intellect. That's all about, you know, the things we can't understand and the things we need to uh, submit and say we don't know. But something that's much easier to understand than this is the second point is the concept of the verse in the Hillam and Psalms, which says, I'm with him in his suffering. When a person is in pain, God, even though he makes no mistakes and knows what he's doing and has a plan, he can still, and he does, he feels it deeply and he's with each person in their suffering and in their pain. My name is Yankee Tauber. I'm a writer and editor. Was the tree of knowledge just a trap? God creates Adam and Eve, puts them in the Garden of Eden, 
and they can have whatever they want, except for one tree, which obviously just happens to have the most delicious, most luscious, most attractive looking fruit in the whole garden. So obviously, how long is it gonna take until they actually taste that tree? The truth, however, is that when we're talking about the Garden of Eden and the Tree of Knowledge, we're really talking about our lives. How many of us go through even one day uh, of our lives without doing something that we know is wrong. And that's really what much of our life is taking up, is basically cleaning up the messes that we make. So why why did God create us in such a way? Why, why were we put into a world that uh, from every side there's almost an invitation to failure? And the truth is, however, that that's the only way that we end up doing anything that's really original and really meaningful in our lives. That's when our true creativity and our true abilities come to light. So at the end of the day, this trap is really the trap of life. It's the trap that we're all in. And every single day we have to pick ourselves up and, 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 and start again, so to speak, and start creating a new something special and unique. Is that a wrap? Yeah, that's a wrap.